first of all, my name is Sonia again. I'm from Social Science Data Archives from Slovenia, and I will uh, I will start this presentation with um, introduction on journals and open data policies. Um, we all know that more and more journals are demanding from authors who base their articles on data to make their data accessible not only for the peer review but also for the readers. Uh, so journals can be more or less strict in what they ask from the authors. There are journals where authors are obliged to make all data used in the article publicly available at the time of the publication. Uh, and there are others where data sharing is encouraged but not mandatory. For example, uh, at the Humanities and Social Science Communications Journal, uh, authors are required to make materials, data and associated protocols promptly available to readers and any restrictions on the availability of material <clears throat> or information must be disclosed to the publishing team at the time of submission already. At the Social Science Archives, uh, we support authors in publishing their data and relevant documentation uh, explaining their data. And in the Slovenian archive, we have noticed a bit of confusion among researchers about concepts and data services available on the national and international level. In order to contribute to raising awareness, uh, Sergei and me, we will share um, with you some basic needs and solutions that are, that are out there for researchers provided by data archives. So, Sharing data is a basis of transparent open science. However, sharing data wheresoever is not in line with the so-called FAIR principles. If we share data via USB email or on the project webpage, we authors and also reusers have no guarantee that data will be available for the future use, that the data is, is or will be understandable outside the project group. There is also uh, no guarantee of the quality of data. Uh, bibliographic information needed for citation is not provided and outreach of this data is of course limited. I will just briefly show the report of a research group, uh, which were an, uh, they were analyzing more than 500 articles based on data that were published between 1991, uh, 1991 and 2011. Uh, in these articles, authors were stated as those who should provide data to the readers. Um, the report shows uh, that on the long term, authors are not good data curators. Uh, researchers found out that only 19% of the requested data uh, was provided by authors. Major cause was that data were lost or, or on inaccessible storage media. Another cause was that email addresses of authors were not working anymore. So readers uh, of the article were not able to get in contact uh, with authors. Um, now let's move from uh, sharing data to sharing data properly, uh, for which I prefer to use term publishing data. To publish data means that you make your data reusable for purposes beyond the one for which you collected them. Briefly, you make them findable, accessible and reusable to others. In order to make them fair, you should manage them properly. So you or someone else should curate and archive this, this data. Uh, another topic that we would like to discuss about is how to describe data sets to make them understandable. Uh, data description can be more or less structured. One option is um, a description of data within the article. However, in the article you are limited and usually focus is not on data but on the knowledge based on this data. You can publish it in a data journal. There you have more space to describe your data set and explain the interesting details from the data collection um, phase. However, uh, the most proper way, way is to use the standardized data description, uh, to use metadata format, which is recognized by data repository. In this case, your description will be attached to your data set. It will be included in data catalog, will provide the same information as other data sets in the catalog, and will be findable and understandable to those who haven't read the article. Um, 
so let's move to data uh, repository services. Um, data repositories on the national and international level uh, support researchers when they need to preserve and display their data sets. Related documentation, also metadata. They offer expertise and services, making data available now and also for the future. But how to find the right repository? One option is to check the registry of research data uh, repositories where you can filter repositories according to your uh, needs. Another option is to check in your research community if there is a domain specific trustworthy repository available. At this point I will pass word to Sergeya to tell us a bit more about social science data archives available in uh, in Europe. So um, one organization that is actually works as a data repository service is Consortium of Social Science Data Archives. This is SESDA. So we, are, we who are organizing this event are from SESDA, uh, or better said from data archives that, are, uh, that, that work under SESDA. Um, so yeah, SESDA is actually um, composed of data archives that offer data repository services. Uh, and in this regard, provides a sustainable research infrastructure, uh, enables uh, researchers and research community to conduct high quality research uh, in social sciences, uh, offers services to data producers, like uh, how to prepare their data, how to, how to store their data. Um, and actually with doing this, it contributes to production of solutions to ma major, major challenges we are facing in society today. For example, uh, building a COVID-19 data collection at the moment. Tesla also facilitates teaching and learning in the social sciences, which, which is actually the biggest part of uh, working with researchers and for researchers. So it actually consists of, uh, includes 23 members and 30 partners at the moment, uh, and it has a full European coverage. So um, we're, we're kind of happy to talk about that. And I would say that, as Sonia mentioned, uh, publishing should be, should be done properly, and as a reporter is ensure this safe path to, to proper data, 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 publishing and sharing the, the data. Um, so just to mention, um, and I already mentioned that this uh, event is uh, organized by two working groups under SESA training, uh, working group, which are training events and journals outreach. So training events are responsible for training of researchers and data users, or let's say reusers, for because they're using secondary data. And, uh, Journals Outreach uh, provides support for journals and editors in open data policy decision making because they're they are kind of talking to them, um, not only talking to them, but also training them. They're like supporting journals and also researchers in a way how to, how to come to uh, safe publishing of their data and uh, what does that even mean? So another thing that, would, uh, that, that I would like to mention today is Data Management Expert Guide that is actually a pr product of uh, um, expert from SESDA. Uh, it is actually designed for researchers, um, especially those who are at early stage of planning their uh, research because uh, it's, it's basically meant for people uh, to start their research uh, data management plan. Uh, this tool guides them through their research and, you know, uh, yeah, it's, it's like a guidance for researchers on how to start the research and what to do uh, with their data in, in the meantime, in, in between the whole research and where to store the data and how to actually make data available uh, for others. And in this regard, um, ensure transparency of the data that will be talk that um, colleagues will be talk about later. So yeah, uh, with this guide, actually, SESDA wants to contribute uh, to professionalism and data management, and actually, as I said, to value to increase the value of research data. Um, and yeah, uh, also 
since um, since this guide covers all stages of data life cycle, it also is kind of designed to help social science researchers to make their data fair, meaning findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, meaning that their data is not only uh, findable, findable or meant for other researchers, for other people, but also for machines. So we can do things automatically and we can do things in a proper way. So you will find this proper way uh, in data management expert guide that will guide you uh, from start to the end of your research project. You can see in this, uh, uh, on the right side in this picture, the data management uh, expert guide um, kind of offers uh, um, guiding all, on all stages or from planning, organizing, processing, storing, protect, archive and publish, and uh, also then discover. And today we're basically more or less talking about in this part of archiving and publishing. Um, as I said, um, uh, data management expert guide is is designed to support fair principles, and to to support to achieve this fairness, um, you should have you should at least have three things: uh, um, a persistent identifier, for example, DOI, that is actually identifying your data object, a sufficient set of metadata, and clear license. So data archives are actually the ones provide services in order to uh, publish your fair data. Let's let's move uh, from the services um, that uh, CESDA archives are offering to the final product, which should be like um, a goal also of the, each researcher who is collecting um, data. So data publication um, is expected um, that, uh, so if you want to say that you actually produce the data publication, uh, your data uh, should be, um, should go through a similar pu publication process as an article. So you should provide properly document, documented, um, should be properly documented with metadata, should be reviewed for quality, uh, should be searchable and discoverable in catalogs or databases, should be also citable in publications. And um, of course, uh, this kind of uh, data publication is then publicly accessible now and also for the future. Uh, and access to data is clearly determined and does not depend on, depend on author's uh, caprice. Um, so, Sergei, can you move on <laughs> with the slides? Yeah. Um, so, as you already know, uh, there are uh, different data publishing uh, routes available. They are provided, of course, by various types uh, of repositories, which offers uh, which offer services uh, to researchers. So, first, let's try, uh, let's start with uh, trusted domain-specific repositories. Sergey, can you switch on? Yeah. Um, so, what do they offer? They offer uh, experts, so data curators uh, for specific data types or specific topics or disciplines. They build specialized data catalogs. They're connected with other research data archives in archive community. They share their knowledge, uh, maybe also tools and, uh, and expertise. Uh, they publish, uh, they archive and publish data of a higher quality, uh, which have potential for uh, reuse. Uh, they also provide technical and content review and some of them also scientific review, to, so they evaluate the scientific value of, of your data set and they can also hold a certificate of being a trustworthy uh, repository. Um, in institutional, uh, so institutional repositories uh, are meant, um, are uh, advised to be used uh, when one should publish the data, but there is no domain-specific repository available. Usually they're, of course, meant for researchers from one institution. Then we also have general purpose repositories. Uh, these are recommended when there is no domain-specific or nor institutional repository. Um, 
so they publish data from various, various disciplines. Their services are adapted to heterogeneous and long tail data. There is no guarantee for long term preservation and no technical and scientific review of data and documentation is, is available. Um, yeah, so we know that there are more and more journals encouraging researchers to share, archive, and publish their data. However, push is coming uh, from the research funders. For example, European Commission in the New Horizon Europe program made research data management uh, mandatory for projects generating or reusing data. So they ask researchers to think about persistent identifiers, about standardized metadata frameworks, and they, they choose trusted repositories already at the project proposal uh, stage. Um, to close down this introductory session, Sergey, can you move further? Um, our message is to keep in mind that domain-specific repositories provide experts to support researchers at various stages of research data lifecycle, as Sergey already mentioned before. Um, data curators, data archivists can support you in the planning of your data collection, and also they can assist you in the process of archiving and publishing your data in alignment with the fair, fair principles. So we are out there in the national um, social science data repositories available to support you. Just call us or write us, we are out there for you. So thank you for your attention and yeah, let's open um, some minutes to the discussion. I would like to invite uh, Mariana and Dennis to to maybe uh, start with the presentation. Uh, if we have any questions, uh, you can ask us, or maybe also, if not, Mariana and Dennis can start. Okay, so th thank you, Sergeya. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Dennis from the Croatian Social Science Data Archive. And with me here is Mariana, who will appear later. <laughs> And then we'll be talking about the elements of research transparency, uh, which is a topic that connects uh, somewhat to uh, the things discussed by Sergeya and Sonia. So the first question that uh, we should ask ourselves and that we would like to answer at least shortly, uh, briefly, is what do we talk about when we talk about research transparency? It's a word, transparency, that's been tossed around quite often uh, in the past few years, uh, especially in the context of the open science movement, and actually represents uh, or can pertain to various parts of the research cycle, some of them related to uh, the period uh, before publication and some of them relating to the period after uh, some work is published. Uh, to start, uh, I will be talking about the before part, uh, the first thing I want to discuss are the uh, transparent research methods. As uh, probably all of you know who have done some research, uh, each study is uh, that depends heavily on subjective uh, assessments made by the researchers and by the freedom the researcher has to study the chosen topic. So that's that also brings us to the first thing that is uh, where transparency is needed, and that is uh, the transparency regarding the research questions and also transparency about the hypothesis that we wish to make in a certain study. So we have all the world to choose from, all the all possible social questions and topics that we can uh, research, and the first thing that we have to do is transparently, openly, and uh, well, publicly available, <laughs> availably uh, list our research questions and our hypothesis. The second things, thing that we can choose and that we have to be transparent about are the research measures that we plan to use to study the things that we want to study. So if you are studying depression, to be clear about the measures that you have used to study depression, the questionnaires and the other assessment tools that you use to uh, gauge some topic, uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, object of research that you're interested in. Uh, also, we have to be transparent about the methods that we use or the methods that we want to use in a certain study. So how exactly are we going to collect our sample? How exactly are we going to uh, code 
the various categorical responses, for example, or uh, stuff like that. And also about all possible procedures uh, that we do in a study, uh, which is related also to the methods, but also to the procedures that we applied to the raw data that we have collected in order to make it usable for any uh, analysis that we would like to make. And finally, to be open about those analyses that we, that we are making. So to transparently state which uh, statistical procedures or in general analytical procedures were used on a certain data set and how they were used to answer the research, research questions that we have stated earlier. Each of these steps uh, is heavy, heavily, it relies heavily on uh, researchers' subjective uh, assessments of what is the best approach to study a certain question. And given the large amount of freedom, there were uh, in recent years some uh, proposed uh, um, in interventions to fix those uh, degrees of freedom to uh, uh, entice the, the researchers to uh, plan ahead and to commit to a certain set of actions and analysis and procedures and methods and questionnaires uh, before they even uh, start collecting the data. So one of those proposed interventions were pre-registrations or was the process of pre-registering a study, which means uh, stating all those things I've covered earlier uh, beforehand, before collecting any data and making it publicly available on some uh, server, for example, the open science framework. So having a time stamped uh, document that says, I will use these questionnaires, I will analyze the data in this way, I will collect that many participants and so on. Uh, the pre-registration process in itself is an informal thing. It is not binding and it, is not, it does not have to be reviewed. So a researcher comes out and says, I will do this, makes it publicly available, timestamps it, and then the idea is that uh, we uh, have to be, we can be held accountable uh, if there are discrepancies between the pre-registered plan and the, well, the procedures and the analysis that we have conducted in a reported study. Uh, this can also be formalized through registered reports, which are a new, fairly new uh, article or publication method that actually asks, asks the researchers to do all those things that they do in pre-registration, but uh, the proposed study then goes through peer review in the first stage before any data is collected. And after review, when the reviewers and researchers are satisfied with the questions that are being posed and with the ways that those questions will be answered, then researchers start collecting data. And the idea is that no matter what the outcome is of those analysis, so no matter if the hypothesis is confirmed or rejected, uh, this study will be published because everybody, uh, in quotation marks, agrees that the method to study the question was valid and that the method itself was good. Uh, finally, uh, even if you do not want to pre-register your study and even if you do not want to uh, make a registered report, one uh, important component of transparency regarding research methods is to share the analysis code, to share the, the all lab notebooks, the documents that show the procedure that you use to get from a research question to a published study. So the more open that you can be, the better. Uh, with that, I'll give word to Mariana for a bit. Okay, so we are switching now. Hello to everybody. Uh, so after uh, Dennis was talking about what happens with transparency uh, before the manuscript is, is written, uh, I will now start to uh, talk something about uh, from the moment when the manuscript is, is written. So after the research is done uh, and the man manuscript is written, uh, it, can be, it can be posted uh, to one of many preprint servers as a next step in making a research process open and transparent. 
uh, there are many options available for doing that and uh, one of them is for instance uh, institutional repositories and you can ask your academic librarians all about that some other options are for social sciences for in instance uh, social archives archive you can find it just by googling it uh, when you um, when you publish preprint uh, it can then be uh, subject to open peer uh, review process, which is another effort contributing to promotion of transparency in science. OPR, as we can call it, uh, has different meanings for different people and communities, uh, but there is no agreement about its features or how to implement it in practice, actually. So OPR can be understood as an umbrella term for a number of overlapping ways that peer review models can be adopted in line with the aims of open science to bring greater transparency, inclusivity and accountability of the process. Uh, this is uh, actually a pragmatic definition and it was developed for the Open Air 2020 project uh, by uh, author called Ross Holler uh, in his systematic review on open peer review definitions and this was published in 2017. Uh, several main aspects uh, or traits of OPR can be identified. Uh, these are uh, open identities, open reports, open participation and open interaction. Open identities means that both authors and reviewers are aware of each other's identities. So this is a non-blinded process. Open reports means that the review reports are published alongside with the main article. Uh, open participation means that members of the wider community are able to contribute to the review process. And open interaction is about allowing and encouraging direct uh, reciprocal discussion between authors and reviewers and or between reviewers. So these traits can be combined in different ways uh, and can be also complemented uh, by some other aspects such as uh, open peer review menu or open pre-review manuscripts uh, this is where manuscripts are made immediately available in advance of any formal peer review pro, uh, procedures. So, so this is about uh, uh, peer reviewing the preprints, -pre before mentioned preprints. Uh, and then uh, we have open final version commenting. So this is uh, post-publication peer review, we can call it. Uh, and also we uh, have open platforms uh, for uh, so-called decoupled review where review uh, is facilitated by a different organizational entity than the venue of uh, publication so some examples of such platforms that offer such features are pub peer for instance and science open to mention just uh, just a few uh, and they offer so-called post-publication peer review, among uh, other, other things. Um, if we talk about uh, implementations, we can see that uh, variations of OPR are already in use by some journal publishers, but the whole concept is still developing uh, and it is actually very new to everyone uh, including journal editors authors reviewers and uh, also the the readers uh, so here uh, we can see uh, the platform which is called responsible editorial policies or shortly prep uh, which was recently developed to facilitate uh, journal editors to become transparent about their editorial procedures. Uh, it, it also gives advice uh, to journal editors and publishers on potential improvements of their pre-review procedures. 
uh, and presents integrated information about the variety of review uh, procedures currently in use. Uh, this platform is very interesting. It is new, uh, but uh, for now it, it can be used to identify uh, pub publishers and journals that have implemented OPR policies. But uh, be aware uh, that uh, the database is uh, new and uh, includes a limited number of journals. So you will not, you will not be able to find uh, everything, uh, everything here. Uh, so, the next thing uh, we can talk about when we talk about transparency in science in general, not strictly about the, 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 the research transparency, uh, is responsible research assessment. Transparency in science will actually not work in practice if it is not followed by improved incentives for researchers. So research publications, when they have, uh, once they have passed the traditional peer review process, are then often the primary measure of a researcher's work, hence the phrase uh, publish or perish. Uh, general assessment is often based on metrics such as the number of citation publication collects, for instance, age index, uh, or uh, even the perceived level of prestige of the journal, which is very bad. Uh, journal it was uh, article that articles was was published in. Uh, so uh, this is quantified by the journal impact factor. So predominance of such metrics and the way uh, they might distort incentives has led to the rise of several relevant global initiatives in the last decade, such as the San Francisco Declaration of Research Assessment, the Leiden Manifesto, the Hong Kong Principles for uh, Assessing Researchers. All of these incentives call for a more fair and transparent research assessment system. It is necessary to move away from publication metrics to focus rather on the content, quality and added value of the scientific outputs. Underlying all of these issues with metrics is that they are produced by commercial entities e.g. Clarivate Analytics, Elsevier, and uh, the issue is that they are based on proprietary systems, which can lead to some issues with transparency. That's, that, what, that is one of the uh, biggest problems. Uh, so in the recent years, uh, alternative metrics, or we can call them alt metrics, have become a topic in the debate uh, about balanced assessment of research efforts. So cita citation counting uh, can be complemented by other online measures of research impact, including bookmarks, links, blog posts, tweets, likes, shares, press coverage, and the like. So now I will leave you with that and we will switch again. So you'll see, you'll see Dennis again. Yes, and for the final switch, uh, we are going beyond the peer review uh, process and beyond the publication process and looking ahead into the future, uh, maybe both short term and long term. And we will talk about numerical, numerical reproducibility. So uh, what that is, is the ability to reprodu reproduce the results of a published study uh, with minor uh deviations so the reproduce the exact statistics obtained in a study uh from uh, using the same proce analytical procedures and using the same data as the original published study uh to be able to achieve numerical reproducibility we of course have to have the data that was used in the original study and it's preferred of course that the data is openly available that it is published in a trusted repository and of course, that is, it is well documented so that the data set has all the relevant information contained and that describes the context in which the data was collected and that uh, allows us to interpret the values stored in a certain data set. But the data alone is not enough, of course. We also have to have 
uh, the code, preferably the code that was used to do the statistical analysis and that was used to do the data cleaning and every bit of data manipulation. Of course, that code should be openly available. Uh, a plus is if it's well written. Of course, any code that works uh, and in the intended way is better than no code. And uh, lastly, if the code is well documented, uh, that's even better. So having uh, good descriptions of what each part of the code does to the data and what it does for the statistical analysis. Uh, but data and code are not everything we need. We also need software. And this can be construed very broadly. Uh, I have uh, put here an example. So the popular open source programming language R, uh, which some of you at least are familiar with, was first, so the version version one, it was released in the year 2000, version two was re it released in 2004, and the current version 4.1.2 was released this year. Uh, a key aspect of long-term numerical reproducibility is having uh, some environment that allows us to use uh, the software that was used in the original study today. So if a study was conducted in 2013, we have to have a way to run uh, the analysis, and if R was used for the analysis, we have to have a way to run the same code using the same R version 3 environment and the same versions of packages. This is a technical problem, and it's a problem that a lot of computer scientists are trying to deal with. Uh, there are some uh, promising or popular approaches, like using Docker containers, uh, which you can uh, which uh, information on which you can find online very easily. So open source software that creates a virtual, virtual environment that allows us to run different versions of uh, software. So packaging all of this together, so the data that has to be somehow available, the code that also has to be somehow available and that has to work, of course, and the surrounding software, uh, at least the uh, versions of the software that were used for the analysis, but also uh, we can go even further, so if you're uh, even further and talk about uh, somehow packaging uh, whole systems into some virtual environment uh, to enable us to uh, reproduce the results of studies in the long run. Uh, and with this beyond, we are going beyond, beyond, and thanking you for your attention. Uh, these are our contacts, and you can uh, reach us at these email addresses or on Twitter. At, on these handles, and this is cross this handle also. If you have any uh, questions that you would like to direct, direct to point directly at us. Um, so yeah, if, I guess we are opening the floor for questions. If there are any, if you don't see the chat, my question, yeah, for yeah. example, was yeah. when was this OPR thing introduced? Uh, sorry. I didn't hear uh, it. When, when was OPR introduced? How old is the thing? Well, as far as I know, the first efforts uh, took place probably 20 years ago with uh, BMJ and in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in a field of medicine. So this is, the, the concept is, the idea is not so new. But in social but sciences? In social sciences, it's it's coming. It's uh, it. There are not so many journals in social sciences that implemented these policies. But we, uh, as far as I know, and as far as I saw, you can, for for instance, uh, search through this uh, 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 database. Uh, there are not many. So in social sciences, uh, this is still not um, not implemented. Okay, thanks. Just, mm -hmm. oh. I mean, uh, just to finish, I, I mean, th there are some journals uh, from social sciences. So th this is not that, that it is not uh, completely uh, uh, non not applicable to social sciences, but it's just uh, getting slower. Yeah. Uh, F uh, one thousand research is one of the 
examples of peer review journals and they are accepting uh, also social sciences although there are not many in there as as, as far as i as i know uh, so the question from uh, Moitza is, are there some good reasons for not accepting preprints to institutional rep repositories? Uh, a valid reason is that institutional repository stores peer-reviewed knowledge, uh, be it final works or studies, journals and monographs published by the university and relevant versions of articles, monographs, chapters published at uh, publishers. So I, I think this uh, depends on uh, how you define your institutional repository. Uh, so it can vary from uh, organization to uh, organization. I don't see uh, any, uh, any reason why not to do this. Uh, and we would accept it, but there might be a different um, uh different practices around that oh can i can i can i ask for something because um <laughs> follow following the chat um i can see that uh, there is a bit of an exchange there between mocha and matthew uh, in relation to open research europe and f1000 as a platform um i don't know if uh, either of them want to say something about this uh, Or if, if uh, Mariana or Dennis uh, know something about this uh, relationship there? This is Moitza, if I may? Yes, please. Okay, um, so um, I'm coming from the University of Ljubljana, Slovenia. Um, fully um, supporting open science, all aspects, data, publications, and so on. Yes, it is true, as Matthew has uh, written, that uh, the Open Research Europe platform uh, uses uh, the F1000 platform. It is uh, a public uh, procurement tender for a few years in the uh, few million uh, euros worth. Um, yeah, what I just wanted to show that uh, this platform has um, a topic, social sciences, because in uh, one of the previous, uh, chat uh, notes there was uh, a mention of a certain journal or, or uh, Mariana has told us uh, yeah so there is social sciences also at the open research Europe which is multidisciplinary platform just to add quickly so um hi this is Matthew Cannon I work for Taylor and Francis which is um, includes f1000 as well um, but yeah, so Open, Open Research Europe, which was only launched about a year ago, um, does accept content in all subject areas um, for people who are funded by the European Union. Um, but we've actually seen quite a lot of social science and humanities content come through, um, perhaps a surprising amount. You would expect mostly science. Um, researchers to be happy with an open access, open data, open peer review model, um, but uh, actually we've seen a lot more social science and humanities content being published on that platform um, than so to date. Um, one of the reasons for it is actually, well, that we wonder is whether actually, because there's a lot fewer um, venues that offer open peer review, open data for humanities social science researchers, um, to pick from um, and so maybe that's one of the reasons why it's been so popular so far um, but yeah I'll talk more about what Tell and Francis F1000 are doing a bit later but yeah just wanted to add that yeah, yeah. I mean uh, I came back to the to this slide the uh, the, the acceptance of uh, uh, open peer review policies are not huge in all sciences as you can see here uh, in the in this graphic graphics that uh, for instance, if we look just at review reports, uh, which are publicly accessible, which is just one trait, one element of uh, OPR, uh, it's just basically 1%, of course, 1% of the amount of journals that are represented in, in, this, um, in this platform. Uh, but it, it is still, um, yeah, just coming. But, but what, what I can see uh, from, from, from literature, it is coming very quickly. Hopefully, I'm sharing my um, my screen now, and um, where I am showing you very quickly that there is a dedicated website to the Agenda 2122, the SESTA Agenda 2122 Training Task Two, which is the 
training task that was mentioned earlier. And this is the one dedicated to journals outreach. And uh, most of you are familiar with this because I guess many people attended the first event and this is why you are joining the second, but if not, then here you are. The first event was more generic and um, a few months ago, and uh, we decided to, for the second event, to uh, go a little bit more in depth into what does it, um, what does social science transparency look in practice? And uh, to that effect, we will have, as you know from the program, and um, for the second part, five presentations. I will let the presenters um, introduce themselves as well as the title of the presentation. We will follow this order, as you can see it here. Every presenter will have 15 minutes, roughly. And if you want to allow for four to five minutes of questions, um, or if you run out of time, then you will not have any questions. You will have to save the questions for the very end. So it's a two hour um, part and there are five presentations, which allows between 15 and 20 minutes in the end for the kind of overall discussion. And of course, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Seraphim Abanides from Gesis, and I am uh, responsible for uh, training task two, the general outreach. Um, but we have a large group of collaborators on task, and uh, you can see them on the website that I mentioned earlier. I will also post the website on the chat. So without further ado, I would like us to move to the first uh, speaker. And um, yes, the screen is shared and the floor is yours, Ronald. Thank you. Yes, hello everyone. Then let's begin. Thank you for the introduction and for having me here today. I'm Roland Ramplum from the Leibniz Institute for Psychology in Trier, Germany, abbreviated ZPIT. Um, I'm working there as head of the um, infrastructure department dealing with uh, archiving and publication. And uh, ZBIT is an infrastructure institute supporting researchers with tools and services for psychological research. In this talk, I will introduce you to these tools for open science and psychology and summarize our lessons learned from practice. Uh, first of all, let's take a look at why we need open science practices in psychology at all. A strong motivation for the rise of open science has been the so-called replication crisis. Basically, a replication is the repetition of a previous study with a specific purpose. Um, the aim is to support or to disconfirm previous findings with a new sample to draw more reliable conclusions. In recent years, findings in various disciplines, including psychology, have failed to be replicated. For the field of psychology, the Open Science Collaboration conducted a replication of 100 studies published in three important psychology journals. From these 100 effects they looked at, only 39 could be replicated successfully. All in all, the magnitude of effects was lower in the replication for most studies. And this finding might indicate that there were practices in action that systematically led to a biased effect sizes and higher probability for significant results in the publications. An infamous article by Ioannidis already expected a high rate of false positives in psychological research in 2005 before this empirical examination. In his analysis was founded on the observation of analytic practices. So multiple independent testing of research questions by different groups lead to finding significant results just by chance, even though there are indeed no true effects. Selective reporting then later distorts the whole picture. From a statistical point of view, the probability for false positive, type one error rate, should equal the significance level alpha, which is 5% in most cases. And this is the probability of finding an effect, although none exists. But due to flexibility in data collection, analysis decisions, and selective reporting, false positive rates are in practice drastically higher. This is a severe problem for the credibility of research findings in psychology. Um, as a starting point for the investigation into these questionable research practices, a prominent display from the manifesto for reproducible science 
locates these along the research cycle. You can see it here in the picture. And there are three very obvious questionable practices. The first one is harking, which means hypothesizing after results, results are known. And this just means that hypotheses can be specified after the data has been collected in a way to produce a positive finding. P-hacking means that data and model parameters are manipulated in a way to find significant relationships. A researcher might just fish in the data until a spurious finding is found by chance at some point. Uh, and if in one study no significant finding can be claimed, perhaps the study remains just in the file drawer. Positive findings are submitted more often to journals and are accepted with a higher probability. And as a consequence, the universe of study findings that are finally published are a highly selective sample of all the studies conducted and are more likely to report positive findings. So following these developments, scientists asked for support from research infrastructures like ZPIT in slowly adapting the norms and standards in psychological science and creating the necessary tools. And this is the mission of ZPIT. ZPIT is a public open science institute uh, for psychology and related disciplines. And the goal is to become a one-step research support organization offering research infrastructure services for each stage of the research cycle. Again, we make use of this cycle to illustrate the ideas we try to support. Starting at the beginning, this green area with the information search, access to scientific works should be open and free of charge. In the study planning phase, relevant protocols for data collection and metadata should be adhered to to enhance scientific quality and reusability of collected data later. Before the data collection starts, the study protocol should be pre-registered the methodological quality of a research project can be assessed independently of the results and the researchers get early feedback from peers um, to further improve the quality and soundness of their study um, on the methodological level. The tools and code used for the data analysis itself should be open and allow reproducibility and um, should enable collaborative checks to improve the analytic procedures. For reusable data and other digital research objects, it's often not sufficient to just upload it into any archive. We heard about that earlier, but also to consider the FAIR principles. And finally, the publication of results and data should be open access to enable free exchange. As a one-stop support organization, ZPIT now offers one main tool for each stage of the cycle to put the associated ideas into practice. And I will give you now a very quick overview of the tools. Starting our journey in the green area with the information search, um, you all know Google Scholar, which is a great tool to get a quick overview of a research field. But if you need a really comprehensive overview, for example, for a thesis or writing a research grant, Additional use of specialized databases makes much sense because they account for more things, for example, things which are not available online or are secured behind a paywall. Syndex is such a database for psychology. ZPIT creates this database complementary to the much bigger, much larger database PsychInfo from the American Psychological Association. And if you search both PsychInfo from the APA and Syndex from ZPIT, you cover the field of psychology research in great depth. And as ZBIT is an open science institute, Synex can be used for free in the search engine PubPsych. So what is this search engine PubPsych then? PubPsych is a search portal for psychological material. Material means, for example, literature, research data, intervention programs, or psychrometric instruments. Um, and all the data available in PubPsych comes from ZBIT and six partner organizations. Each of these partners produce their own databases of material, and all of these databases are then technically merged together and made available in PubPsych. It includes data from Germany, the US, France, Norway, Spain, the Netherlands. Um, and this broad range of countries ensures you do not overlook European literature, as many of the established big providers are very focused on US research. As usual with ZPIT products, use of PubPsych is free as well. And if you're done with your information search, uh, things usually get up to speed. 
you need to plan your study and make preliminary calculations. Uh, and we have a service called Notebook, which is available to support you with these tasks. It's like Notebook is an online platform that can be used for study planning, collaborative data analysis and teaching in the statistical programming language R. It fosters open methods, open source, use and reproducible workflows. Logging in with your ORCID account leads you to a dashboard where you can manage projects. The project consists of R scripts, markdown files, and files with your data. These projects then can be shared with others. One great thing, especially when working with R newcomers, is that by starting a project, the user can immediately run a file-fledged R environment without prior installation of software on his or her computer. It all runs online in your browser. Uh, which is great if you don't, because you don't have any hassle of installing all the things necessary. So this tool helps you to plan your study. And the next step then would be to pre-register your study. Zeptit promotes that via the pre-reg in psychology platform, where users can pre-register their studies to get proof of authorship already in the stage of idea development, to verify later that they conducted and reported the analyses as initially planned. This is a vaccine against p-hacking, hacking, and publication bias. As pre-registration is additional work for researchers, Zepit thought about how to incentivize creating these pre-registrations. And we came up with two models to support data collection uh, called the online and the offline lab. So how do these two labs work? As the name implies, studies in the online lab are conducted online. Uh, so researchers implement their study with suitable software and Zepit then buys a sample of the participants from a panel provider for the researchers. That may seem a bit uncommon first, but it's a really great way to offer, for example, quota samples, longitudinal and cross-sectional studies, and multi-country multi studies um, in a very convenient way for the researchers. So if researchers register their study with the lab track, they can get the service for free and they can apply at any time. That's really a great offer, I think, for uh, scientists. The second incentive is use of the offline lab. The offline lab is located at the Trier office of ZBIT and again, as the name suggests, experiments there are run offline on our lab's IT and eye tracking infrastructure. We have three rooms equipped with, with different state-of-the-art eye trackers and uh, the software belonging to them. Researchers provide the code and files for running the experiment, and we take care of the data collection. This last point, collecting the data for the researchers, uh, is what makes this offer special. The whole data collection, again, happens free of charge. Only feasibility and quality is decisive. So much for the data collection part of the research cycle. The next step is archiving and publishing the output. Output in this case does not mean the publication, but the data, the code use, and everything else which has been produced in the research. Entering the next blue phase, we meet Psych Archives. Psych Archives is a disciplinary repository allowing to publish this research material. It supports 20 different types, like preprints, primary and secondary publications, research data, multimedia, software code, and some more psychology specific types like psychometric instruments or pre registrations as well. Every material gets a DOI and is citable. The platform in general is GDPR compliant and supports fine-grained access levels and control. For example, users can choose between fully open material, which can be downloaded immediately, and material restricted to scientific use. For the scientific use material, you have to fill out a form with the intended scientific use before you can download the material and the researchers then learn more about how their material is actually used by others. So with PsychArchives, we try to give researchers control over what they publish from their research work, for whom, and under which access and usage modalities. This makes it more easy to adhere to open science standards without missing that there are legitimate interests of the researchers, which might conflict with making available material for everyone as well as ethical and legal requirements, requirements which need to be addressed. Um, yeah, I think you probably know that as we are here in a Cessna environment. 
Um, after publishing your research material, only one step in the cycle is missing, the publication in a journal. What does ZPIT do in this regard? ZPIT offers the Psych Open Gold program. This program works to produce open access journals like a commercial publisher, imagining Hogrefer or Springer. Um, ZPIT does not own these journals, obviously. They are owned by the editorial board or professional society behind the journal. And this ensures they are scientifically independent. The key difference to a commercial publisher is that the journals using the Psycho Gold program do not charge any fees. There's no APC for the authors, there's no fee for the editors or the societies behind the journals, and no fees, uh, for example, in form of a paywall for the readers. All the cost is covered by ZBIT. Currently, we are publishing 11 journals in different fields of psychology. And earlier this year, we had a call for four new journals and we'll uh, start them at the beginning of next year. This format with the call ensures everyone has a fair chance of establishing a new own journal or transfer an existing journal into an open access model. With regard to the integration of open practices in the journal operation, ZPIT and the editorial boards agree on an implementation of the transparency and openness promotion guidelines those guidelines address eight specific fields where journal publication can be transparent. ZPIT tries to support implementation of the guidelines at the highest possible level for journals. And in the table on the screen, you can see the eight fields um, from the guidelines and each associated ZPIT service. That was a very quick, I'm sorry for the speed, overview of our tools and services. Um, but while creating these, we learned some interesting lessons, and I want to talk about these as well. Um, because when you first come into contact with open science ideas, they often sound very promising. Science will ultimately be transformed from a series of static snapshots represented by papers, by published papers, into some form of real-time practice with a strong emphasis on methodology. So what is not to like here? Um, we compiled some criticism over the last year while speaking with different people about open science practices and their individual experiences in implementing open science in their labs or departments. Um, I leave the judgment of the different arguments to you and maybe our discussion later and just report on what we compiled. First of all, many of these practices take an awful lot of time. Consider annotating your research data extensively so other people understand it. As there's currently nearly no career reward for open science practices, why should one invest so much time in that? In our experience, the reason currently is often simple pressure. Funding agencies, journals, or your PhD advisor uh, force researchers to open up parts of their research, and otherwise it would happen far less. Another point appears when you have opened up your research and others can start to use it. Do they have to credit the original researcher who invested much work into preparing and sharing the materials? Can the original researcher argue they should be co-author on your paper if they reused your material? That's unclear and handled differently in practice. Another point. Imagine you are doing research in a sensitive area. For example, we have one journal which deals with the psychology of sexual offending. And you are very open with your material. Such areas of research are often controversial within the general public or even within the research community. And you cannot expect lay people to adequately understand isolated parts of your research and must prepare for possibly inadequate interpretations or even aggressive reactions to some of these parts. If that happens, you will find yourself often very alone as aggression against scientists is not something regularly considered and handled within the academic framework. But even between scientific colleagues, there is a potential for misuse of material. Imagine a situation where you have a dispute with other researchers and they might use your material in an inadequate manner to prove their own point, for example, by selective reporting or presenting findings out of context. That might not be ethical, but it happens in practice. Other issues are emerging privacy issues for participants. Even if you do a proper pseudonymization or even anonymization, 
modern approaches to big data might still allow for a recombination of very large and very many data sets and in the end allow re-identification of individuals again. So all of these arguments focus on specific aspects of open science, um, but there is even a more fundamental criticism of the system you sometimes encounter. Because open science could only emerge as a response to technological change, uh, especially the advent of the internet. Prior to that, science, if we remember, was performed under very different conditions. Papers were only distributed by academic libraries in paper form. It was impractical to share raw data. Computational methods could only be performed in very specialized facilities and were very inexpensive. And a person typically needed to be a member of academia, academia to access science and other scientists. And then the internet and computing technology removed these constraints on sharing openness and collaboration. Several authors nowadays suggest that the release of vast amounts of data, papers and research results could simply speed up the trend towards an increase in marketization and corporatization of science and will disproportionately benefit large, already well-established companies. Consider the capturing of publicly funded research value by commercial companies. Think of academia.edu, ResearchGate, or some commercial publishers. They let the public pay for science, for conducting science, and try to monetize the output in a form of platform economy for their own benefit. Large publishers nowadays own many of the open science tools regularly used by scientists and sell data analytics products made out of these data. Another aspect is that open science could simply consolidate a different set of gatekeepers instead of removing any, as, is, as some people hope, and introduce more metrics of productivity to motivate scholars to work harder. I think it, it's clear to everyone that there are established mechanisms to eject people from jobs in institutionalized science based on performance, especially career researchers. Some will probably say that's obvious and we need that. But adding more or better metrics without addressing the underlying job security issues, especially for early career researchers, just adds to the ways people will be ejected from the research community. As a result, this may in fact reduce creativity in research because one mistake may end your career. In other words, researchers need the freedom to experiment and fail without repercussions uh, and not to make every last open science output count somehow because it is included in metric. That may sound a bit bleak, Many of the issues can actually be resolved by making open science infrastructures publicly owned, so they are not subject to the dynamics of a neoliberal market-like organization. It can still be publicly controlled. But still, the scientific community needs to discuss what exactly the reward systems in science should be, how these reward systems relate to open science practices, how these metrics should be transformed and used, and what effects technology-driven change has on the system of science. I think as I'm one minute over the time, it's a good point to stop talking for me. Um, I'm not sure if we have now the time for a short discussion, but in the end, uh, there will be plenty of time. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm glad to take up any thoughts and comments you might have later. Thank you, Roland. Uh, yes, unfortunately, there is not much time for questions um, and I cannot see any in the chat anyway. I have a very quick one, if you could respond to this, please. Um, this is in relation to the fact that it's a Leibniz Institute that has set up the service in Germany, and we are talking to an international audience here. So what is the balance between um, kind of German researchers uh, using the service uh, versus international researchers? If you could say a couple of words about this, that would be great, thank you. Right. Yeah, this is a publicly funded institution from the German government, um, but our mission is international. So there are no limits on uh, where you can be or have to be to use the ZBIT products. So yeah, they're free to use for everyone and the German state sends its regards and pays for it. Okay, thank you. And we can uh, discuss the rest uh, in, the, in the general session in the end. So I would like to invite the uh, second group of speakers uh, from DANCE. If you could please share your screen and start the presentation. And again, it's 15 minutes if you want to allow for questions, or 20 if you don't uh, want to respond to questions. 
Thank you. If Roland can stop uh, sharing his screen, I can yes, start please. sharing mine. Mm -hmm. So, uh, thank you. Indeed, uh, we are a small group, uh, Leen Breuren and myself. Um, Leen Breuren used to work for Dans, he's now an independent researcher. And my name is Peter Doren, uh, I work uh, still at, uh, at Dans. Um, we take a little different angle on uh, transparency of research, which is in, in which we put uh, uh, in the focus um, the way we are uh, actually presenting the results of research and the core question underlying what we are presenting uh, here this afternoon is whether the dominant way in which we publish research results and uh, store and share research data, whether that is the optimal one. Um, it is, uh, you could say, a, a bit simplified in this slide uh, on the left hand side, um, the way in which we present um, our result, results and data uh, via catalogs, uh, via articles and so on. And uh, on the right hand, uh, perhaps a bit exaggerated, um, uh, the presentation as a kind of an, uh, an adventure and uh, which researcher doesn't uh, consider what he is doing actually as a kind of an adventure in finding out new insights in his area. Uh, Leen Breuer and I have been working together on uh, various aspects of humanities computing for a long time and also on the way in which um, uh, research uh, data uh, are being presented. Um, already in the 1990s um, that started with uh, what we then called um, a, a, a data marketing project, on the presentation of data. Um, later on and i'm not going into all these developments it was just a, a long road you could say on data presentation in the uh, in the in the dance archive um, on um, the promotion of data availability policies uh, where uh, uh, that we, we were working on already back in the in the early 2010s when uh, by the way the response of journals was almost um, non-existent they haven't hadn't heard of that not in the field of the humanities and the social sciences at least working on enhanced publications and rich, rich internet applications um, again in that time and um, in 2016 we set up the research data journal um, in the social sciences and humanities um, later with an exhibit of data sets and that's what we are talking on today Oops. Yeah, Lane, uh, some years ago, made an extensive typology of ways in which um, uh, uh, research outputs are being presented, the typology of more than 80 types. Again, um, uh, not really the time here in, uh, in just 15 minutes or so to go into that, but there appears to be a, a very broad range of ways in which research results can be presented. Um, when we set up the data journal, um, that was apparently uh, to have a, a couple of added values, to exploit a couple of added values that the data journal has over the traditional way in which we present, um, on the one hand, uh, research results in, in traditional journals and, uh, and research data in repositories and archives. Um, it was our attention much more to showcase data sets, to have ways of quality controls and obviously also uh, transparency, to provide credits for the data collection and, and preparation and sharing uh, through both data papers and data reviews. The research data journal that came out of that is published by Brill Publishers. It is a full open access uh, journal. And by the way, um, uh, the journal is now uh, under CESDA direction since the beginning of this year. And data papers describe the research context of data sets, not the research question is the central problem. That is more something for a traditional research paper perhaps. Um, but more the context in which a data set was collected and how it is uh, presented. 
we aim for much more functionality uh, when we started um, with a variety of interactive um, uh, data visualizations, uh, online data explorations, animated illustrations, and what have you. Um, obviously, also to um, to make uh, to to to, to um, assist in the making fair of um, of data. We also used um, a fair data review form that was designed at the time. Uh, but what we did find out that was that the publishing platform um, of Brill, like many other online journals, supports only limited functionality in terms of data presentation and data reviewing. The review process is still very much geared towards the reviewing of the article, not of the data. Um, also what we found, so, so you could say on the one hand, the publisher uh, had its limitations. On the other hand, also the researchers themselves have their limitations, if I may say it like this. That is that many of the data papers that were submitted actually tended towards normal research articles um, in which still the research question was the central thing to be answered. And this is why we started um, uh, exploring the possibility of an exhibit of data sets um, in which um, um, much more would be possible than in the data journal and in the data archive. And what we ultimately aimed at is to connect uh, things. Uh, the data showcases in the data exhibit uh, link both to archive data sets and to data papers to offer a more coherent uh, a whole of um, uh, what the research was about and what the data is about. You could say that the objectives of the showcases are summarized in this slide to draw attention to the data, to contribute to its fairness, to provide a coherence of the data in its context of the research, to uh, uh, offer uh, multimodal um, uh, possibilities for exploring the data to, in order to provide context, which would obviously also um, increase the trust that others can have in the data that are there. And um, of course, also the transparency that is central in this workshop. But it is still the question whether that really works. Um, you could say that uh, the ideas of new forms of uh, publishing re research results is already old. Um, Stephen Harnott in the 1990s spoke about the future of scholarly skywriting. Elsevier, um, not the least among the publishers, uh, had a project, The Article of the Future, back in 2012. If you click on that website now, you find that the, even the video about the subject has disappeared into thin air. Um, and when the future is going to be, nobody knows. At DANS, we organized in 2014 the future of scholarly communication and the archive. Um, um, and uh, again, the, the intentions were very noble, but the results were not what we had hoped that they would be. And even just two days ago, we had a researcher giving a presentation at a dance seminar um, who gave the long quote that, uh, that is there at the bottom of the screen, that 10 years ago, uh, she thought that um, the enhanced publication um, uh, would be there. And she would assume that nowadays it would be possible to have a, a very rich possibility to link a research data to the text of the article and so on. But actually she found out that uh, the, the, the possibilities with the publisher of the article um, were very limited. And it must be said that there is really a, a couple of core challenges. What we also hear all the time, that is that, um, yeah, is such a new approach really scalable? Um, is it possible to provide such more rich um, uh, experiences for the reader or the user of the data, the reader of the article or the, the user of the data? Is, is that really possible? It should be 
made quick and easy to produce data showcases. And we think that there is a couple of possibilities there by providing templates, by providing instructions, and also by applying and not, not just and not always just to single data sets or single studies, but also to collections or themes. And the second main challenge that we often hear is about maintainability. Um, can that additional functionality be preserved in the long term? Well, also here we have a couple of answers that uh, by using existing tools, um, by using open source, uh, and by also by using um, uh, the uh, fair data assessment tools that, that have been developed in the meantime, like the Fuji tool, um, that can be guaranteed at least to a, to a considerable extent. But we should perhaps also simply ex accept that some of the showcase functionalities will, will, uh, will disappear over time. But perhaps that doesn't matter because the data will still be retained in, um, in, in, in the traditional data archive. And perhaps I would like to end with an analogy from the museum world where also um, um, quite recently actually the first museum that ever uh, really opened up uh, all its storage facilities, um, the Boymans van Beuningen Museum in Rotterdam, it has, just, uh, it has just opened in a new depot, which is now fully transparent, you could say, and fully, vi um, it, it can be visited. And, uh, and uh, about, um, well, only 10% perhaps of, the, uh, of the, um, the artworks are exhibited in the traditional museum and the rest is all in the depot. And this is typical for most museums. And you can see that also such an endeavor may perhaps also be an example that we could follow in the realm of research data. And that's what, what I would like to, uh, to talk about uh, today. So if there's questions, I don't know if there's much time left. I don't think so, but um, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter, and thank you, um, Len, uh, for sticking to the time, actually. So we have about uh, five minutes or so for questions. I do have a question from <coughs> Janes. Um, can you say a few more words about fair data review, in particular in relation to the checks and assessments that disciplinary data archives are performing, yes. uh, the way that Sonia mentioned earlier? Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah, although I think Sonia was uh, uh, talking more about the reviewing of, of, of papers rather than of research data. And uh, reviewing research data actually is, is, a, is a rather difficult uh, thing to do um, and labor intensive as well. So we have um, tried two, um, two approaches. Um, uh, one approach is the manual approach and the other approach is the automatic approach. Um, the uh, the manual approach for this we did design actually i can look up and put it a bit later in the in the chat um, a fair review form in which we try to extract from the fair uh, principles a couple of questions that the reviewer of a data set then can answer whether that is the case or not um, although that did we did uh, it did work. It does work in in reality, in practice. But it's still, we were still not very completely satisfied uh, with the results, as it's still, well, the 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 fair uh, principles perhaps do not capture well enough the data quality aspect, and um, uh, that is also very difficult to um, to grasp. Uh, I would say. Although if you look at our fair review date uh, uh, form, you can, uh, you can form your opinion whether we succeeded in doing that. And the automatic way is um, a way that was um, uh, done in the FAIRS FAIR uh, project, the Fuji tool. Um, yeah. Sorry? Oh, that was something else. I Sorry about this, yes. Um, the Fuji tool was uh, developed in the FAIRS FAIR project that is a European uh, project uh, uh, headed by, uh, by DANS and it attempts to measure the fairness of data sets in, an, in a fully automat automatic way. Of course, focusing on formal characteristics of the data only. Um, again, the quality aspects are, are very hard to, to grasp in such an automatic way. 
I will, I will put uh, references to both uh, in the chat uh, after the talk. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, regarding the, <coughs> the journal, I have a quick question. Is, is there a um, requirement also to deposit the data? Yes, or there is. We, but, but with one of the, with a, another, with a data archive, is that right? Um, yes. You, pre, you know, um, this is a, 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 again very hard, uh, preferably with a quarterist seal, with a certified um, uh, data archive. But of course, uh, yeah, some people store their data uh, else, still elsewhere. And um, uh, we do allow that because the, the fundamental question is that the data should be fair. That is why we had a fair um, uh, uh, data assessment form. And um, of course, the fairness is greatly assisted if you have your data in a certified repository because the repository already takes takes care of perhaps 80% of the fair criteria. Okay. But this is a requirement. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. I don't see any more questions in the chat. So thank you very much, Peter, for uh, the clarifications as well. And I hope you are around in the end to uh, have a further discussion. Okay, we're moving on to the next uh, two presentations. Oh, I should um, stop sharing. Yes, and... please. <laughs> yes. Um, which will be focusing on uh, replication servers and replicability. And um, we will start with uh, Jonas Recker from Cases. Yes, thank you, Jonas. So uh, you can see my slides. Yes, perfect. Okay, excellent. <laughs> first time I think ever it worked on the first attempt with the two screens and zoom and everything. <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks, uh, Sarah Flim. Um, yeah, so my name is Jonas Recker. I'm, as you said, also from GESES and I'm the manager of the GESES data repository where researchers um, can upload their data on their own um, and pu publish the data there. And what I would like to talk about is a, a very practical look on um, an initiative that was started a couple of years ago um, in Germany. It's called replikationsserver.de, which directly translates as replicationserver.de. Um, and this was an initiative um, where journals and cases cooperated to find ways of um, publishing replication packages um, belonging to articles um, published in the cooperating journals. And I'm going to focus a little bit on the workflows that we use, um, some lessons that we learned, and I'm also going to try to um, look ahead for a little bit. Um, right. So uh, first, a quick look at how it started versus how it's going. So the initiative was launched in 2015 and it was a cooperation between, like I said, two journals, Zeitschrift für Soziologie, um, so Journal of Sociology and Soziale Welt. Um, and the third partner uh, was Gesen's Leib Gesen's Leibniz Institute. And um, before the launch actually happened, of course, there was um, a lot of cooperation, collaboration behind the scenes um, because to launch the initiative, what was needed was policies needed to be developed. Um, the journals had to um, yeah, decide you know, which, which policies they wanted to use for um, the publishing of replication packages, answer questions like, you know, is this a recommendation? Is it going to be mandatory and so on? Um, user guidelines had to be created and the workflows in which the publication would happen um, had to be decided. So this is what, what happened before the launch. And the role of GESIS in this um, is mainly as the provider of the, the technical infrastructure, the repository um, where the data is published. Um, but also, of course, GESIS has a lot of expertise in, in open science and data sharing. And, and this is why I think that our cooperation and collaboration with the journals was very fruitful because I think um, we were able to learn a lot from each other. And um, I think as with our experience in data sharing, there were 
hopefully there was some some advice that we could also provide that was helpful to the journals. So today I was a bit shocked when I prepared the slides to see. Um, yeah, it's uh, six years later now, so some time has has gone by. Um, we have three active journals now who participate um, in the the replica server. Um, we have another three journals who are interested in joining the initiative um, but are not fully joined yet and um, we have about 50 replication packages that were published um, and this these replication packages can be um, the, this can be data actually the, the data used um, to to prepare the results published in the journal um, but it could also be um, code, um, to to replicate um, analyses or um, other forms of, of supplements. And I would just like to have a quick look at the workflow without too much detail, um, because you can see there are many steps and um, <laughs> a lot of communication going on, which I think is an, is an adequate picture because we communicate basically we have three parties so we have the authors um, we have the journal and um, we have the GESIS data repository um, and these three parties communicate um, with each other throughout the the process and I think the um, so basically the the process is initiated by an author submitting an author uh, a, a journal an article to the journal the journal then um, accepts the article submission and prompts the authors to submit the replication files to the GESIS uh, data repository. And then it's the author's task to submit the data. And this is then when, when GESIS gets involved. So we have a curator checking, um, checking the data or code um, on, on ingest. So we look for an anonymization. Um, we check, um, do basic checks for interpretability and things like that. And also our curator then contacts the journal um, to check, um, you know, is, is this, act, you know, does this data submission belong to an article that will be published in your journal so that we can include the, the cross referencing information in the data publication. And once our checks are done and the, the data or code are ready for publication. Um, we publish the, the replication files. Um, the data publication receives a DOI. Um, and this DOI is then submitted to the journal so it can be included in the, the article that is published. And once the, the journal article is published, we um, yeah, put the full um, full citation of the article into our metadata so that we have a cross reference between the journal and the, the data um, in the GESIS repository. And so this is, yeah, this is the workflow. It works fairly well. We make adjustments based on, you know, um, this is this is something we agree on with with an, a specific journal. We agree a specific workflow, but this is roughly um, what it looks like. And I would like to to highlight um, one example um, on on how you know a, a journal implemented the this entire process. Use the example of Zeitschrift für Soziologie because um, they are the ones who have published or for, for whom we have the most pub, um, replication packages in the repository. And their timeline was, was that in 2015, there was an editorial announcing um, that it was to become mandatory that, mandatory that um, authors um, publish um, replication files to a repository for all manuscripts that are based on quantitative data. So there was a, a distinction made between quant quantitative analyses and um, qualitative analyses. The GESIS repository was recommended. Um, so from, from, from 2016 onward, it was mandatory to, um, to submit the data to a repository. 
and um, in 2019, we carried out an evaluation of the publication practice to, to see, you know, how did this um, turn out, uh, what was the compliance among authors and, and so on. And what we found was that um, compliance among the authors was, was really good and it was quite good, easy to see that, you know, it, it increased over time. So initially when the, when the, um, when the policy was published and implemented, the compliance was um, somewhat lower, but it increased over, over time. Um, what we could see is that until 2019, there was an average um, download um, or each, each data or code for an article was downloaded um, about eight times on average, which doesn't sound much, but it's actually, if you consider, you know, that this is um, usually what we, what we would call long tail data, um, even a download time, you know, eight downloads is, is actually not a bad number. Um, and as you can see, um, there were data sets um, downloaded considerably more often, so 33 downloads until 2019. And what we could also see is, of course, that, that the downloads accumulate over time, so something, and, and even over, over the time period of, of three years, you know, the downloads for a given um, data set would continue to go up. So even, even after three years, um, there was still interest in a, in a data set and was continued to be downloaded, which, which was interesting to us. Um, also, what, what we found in the analysis is that from the perspective of the journal, there were no recognizable negative effects either on the submission numbers to the journal, so the, the, the amount of articles submitted, um, or to the journal impact. Um, and I would like to have a quick look on, on lessons that we learned in the, in the past years. Um, and I think the, yeah, first and foremost, the, the lesson that we learn is it takes time. You know, I said, you know, we have a number of journals interested in, in joining the initiative and we, you know, it, it just, it takes time to reach consensus among the editors. Um, policies have to be created, the guidelines have to be created, and then you announce the new policies um, to the to the authors. And what we found is that this is not a matter, often this is not a matter of, of months, it's a matter of years. Um, so we, we are working with journals over a period of, of you know, several years before they, they actively join the initiative. And um, I'm not sure if this is something that's specific to the, the German um, environment, so I would be interested in hearing um, other experiences, but this is what, what we have found. Um, second lesson that we learned is it works. Um, and like I said, you know, the, the download numbers may not be, um, they may not seem very high, but um, the fact that the data is downloaded um, is, is something that, that I think is, a, is good. And it's, it's, um, it shows that, you know, the, the data is noted um, people take note of the data and, and ideally they, they reuse it. Um, what we also see is that from my experience, most authors who submit data to the repository um, provide very well documented data. Um, so there, I, I think there is an inherent motivation involved there to publish um, this data and to make it reusable, which I think is remarkable because it does, you know, it, it means extra work for the authors. And we have very few cases um, um, where, where we get the impression or where authors tell us, yeah, I'm just doing this because I have to. Um, what we also found is that mandates are more effective than recommendations. So a mere recommendation um, will ultimately in our experience, which is a limited experience, but what we saw is that the re recommendation means that most authors are not actually going to submit the data to the repository and that it takes the mandate, you know, to give them that um, little, little push uh, to do it. Um, 
in particular from the from the evaluation that we did for the um, Journal of Sociology, what we found is that restricted access categories create problems for replication. It's this is not surprising, um, but initially the the journal decided, you know, to leave it up to the authors um, which access category they would like to have for the data. Restricted access in our repository means that the data is only um, can only be accessed after the author of the publication um, gives their okay. So someone who wants to reuse the data contacts us, we contact the author um, and they say, um, yes, please uh, give this person access to the data. And what we found is that the data that is, um, this is not the data that gets reused. Um, and another problem was that it's um, also obvious that this would probably happen is that sometimes authors no longer respond to our queries. Um, so the the um, Zeitschrift für Soziologie, for example, have now decided that they want to, um, in, in the mandate, they request that data is made accessible, um, not in this restricted access category, but more, um, more openly accessible. Another thing that we found, and again, this seems obvious, but um, it, you know, we found from the evaluation that it's really important to have in the in the journal article to have a data note um, to have a more yeah formalized um, standard way in which the data set for the publication is cited and referenced, um, because we found that in some cases you know the reference wasn't included or the references took different forms and this is something um, that we also found was um, was important. A very quick out outlook. Um, I would like to start by naming one challenge. I mean, there are many challenges. I think um, the the presentations that we've heard uh, from from Peter and, and Roland also um, have have pointed to some very important challenges that we're facing. Um, a challenge that I see from the perspective of the the repository is that um, the question: How do we compete with commercial or generic? data publication platforms. Um, there for especially for social science data, there are very, very good arguments um, to publish them in a subject specific repository because we know what you know needs to be taken care of, for example, in terms of data protection. But the effort, you know, is is bigger for the authors. You know, if they upload something where there are no index checks, you know, they just publish it, they get their DOI. And they're done. And with our repository and other social science repositories, there's always this step of, you know, there's an index check. Someone looks at the data, has maybe questions about it. And so this is this is a challenge that I see, you know, on how to com compete with these platforms. And um, on a more positive note, um, when I look ahead to the next year, um, I would really like to see us fostering um, exchange and discussion discussion with German journals on, on um, replication practices and, and the publication of, of replication packages, because I think in Germany, you know, it's the, the landscape is still a little heterogeneous. So it's something um, that Zeitschrift für Soziologie and, and Gieses have, have thought about to, yeah, have some discussion there. And I would also like, again, for our repository repository explore a little bit more how we can use the, the technical platforms capabilities um, a little better to make use of the repository more attractive to journals and um, to publishers and yeah this uh, is it and thank you thank you thank you Jonas and thank you for sticking to the time that means we have a few minutes for questions and um, there is a comment from Matthew uh, Cannon that uh, plus one getting authors to see the value of high quality data curation is hard um, yes uh, I agree with this I don't think anyone here disagrees I would like um, clarification please Jonas and I, I also learned quite a few things by attending at the talk and um, it is in relation to the recommendation to deposit the data with GISIS versus um, an, an explicit requirement. I wasn't sure about this. Uh, it, does it apply to all three journals, to one of them? 
And the second one is what happens if um, authors have pre-published and then not only the, the article, but also the data. And then uh, does, do we allow um, double archiving or do we expect them to withdraw the data from wherever they um, published it and then deposit it with the ACs? Thank you. Um, so first about the, the mandate versus recommendation. Um, so we have currently Zeitschrift for Soziologie is, is the one who from the beginning had a mandate. Um, and we have two other journals who, so one started with a recommendation and has now upgraded to a mandate. And we have a third journal um, which has a recommendation and basically um, suggests to authors of, of articles where they think this this is um, this would be a good um, case for archiving. Um, they suggest this to authors, and it's up to the authors to um, to publish the data or not. And yeah, what we see is that as soon as there is a mandate, of, the submissions go go up. And where there's only a recommendation, it's it's really very very rarely rare that that. Um, data is submitted and I mean I, I fully understand why because it's I don't think it's that authors aren't willing to do it but if they're not required to do it then they allocate their their time differently and um, when but that said you know even with the mandated um, deposits we find a really um, high quality of of submission so this is something i would really like to emphasize that you know I, I my impression is not that authors just publish the data because they have to i mean this is the the push they get to actually do it but um i see a lot of motivation to also do it in a in a way that that is done well um pre-publication i have to say that for the replication server we haven't had this scenario yet and i think we it, we would have have to to look at this on yeah on a case by case basis so i mean if a data set has been published has received the persistent identifier and remains unchanged then i think i would be hesitant to to archive it again at cases um but if you know there is no persistent identifier or you know if there have been changes um between pre-publication and publication, then I would be um, very much willing to, to take it. Great, excellent, thank you. I, I cannot see any questions. If anyone has any, please unmute yourself, raise your hand or post it. So thank you, Jonas. I hope you're thank around you. later. And uh, we're moving on now to the next uh, presenter. So Simon Heberger. I hope I pronounced correctly, otherwise, <laughs> please do so when you introduce yourself. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I'm Simon Heuberger. I used to work as the um, replicator for the uh, journal Political Analysis in the US because I did my PhD at American University and my boss was the editor, Jeff Gill. And Based on my work there, I've written two papers that were published, uh, one of them with my colleague, Mike Alvarez. And what I thought I'd do today is start with some general, find, general findings, observations uh, from doing replications for a heavily quantitative political science journal, and then show you a real replication case that caused quite a stir uh, to show how I worked, how I did it, and, and what came out of it. I thought this would be a, sort of an interesting insight. So I don't need to speak much, I guess, about the replication crisis. It has been mentioned. For us in political science, we talk mostly about reproducibility. So it's not taking the same, say, experiment and running it in, in similar circumstances, getting the same results. It's literally taking the code and the data and getting the same results that the author got on their computer. And what we and PA require um, is we, we want your code, we want your data, we need to run it and it needs to um, reach the same results that you got. So what I 
uh, in the replication crisis, what transpired for us is that journals need to require and run the code and that authors need to provide organized and usable material. And I'll showcase a few examples of that in a minute. The second bullet point is what I speak mostly about. This is a paper that was published at PA in 2016 before I started working there. Um, PA was contacted by external researchers who had nothing to do with the paper about irregularities in the code. We then did an in-house replication, I did. And a year later, PA published the original letters critiquing it, the replication and the response from the authors, which I'll just MSHK, those are their acronyms. And that's the, that's the paper we'll be talking about. And the takeaway from all of this comes at the end, which is then in my eyes for a quantitative political journal, the shift which didn't really happen from not just providing code and data, but to actually running it because that's the crux where things consistently fall apart. So for instance, um, this is a selection of top political science journals and what they offer in terms of data transparency. So if you're not familiar with the acronyms, AJPS, American Journal of Political Science, APSR, American Political Science Review, etc. Accessible policy, yes, they have one on the website, most of them do. Almost all of them have a collected archive, such as Dataverse, for instance. All of them require the data and code, but only two out of 10 actually run it, which means authors could almost post whatever they want. It don't have to run, there can be errors in it and, and we, they would move it on to publication. And in my eyes, that's wrong because out of a hundred replication sets that I did about two years, all except one had at least one error, something wrong with it, etc. And all 100 had, sometimes the basic documentation was missing. There was no readme, so you didn't know what to do. There's no master file, which, is, which means there's 20 different R files that you need to run and you don't know in what order. Uh, people put local working directories, so my Google Drive slash Steven or something, which you can't work with. They don't produce any output for the figures and tables in the manuscripts, et cetera, et cetera. And this was not just common, this was the norm almost everywhere. And I want to talk now about one particular paper where this was extreme. So this is the timeline of the paper. Um, we published it in 2016. Then we got the critical letters in 2018. We told the authors about it after I did some replication and confirmed that the letters were correct in the, uh, the insufficiencies they found. The authors then sent us updated code which I assess to be insufficient. We told the authors, this doesn't explain anything. We will go ahead and publish this, the critique in our replication. They then sent another piece of code, which was still insufficient. And then we published the letters, the replication, and we gave the authors a chance to respond, but we heavily redacted it because the code they sent us twice still was not up to par. What I'm gonna talk about now is just the code from 2016, the stuff they originally submitted. And you'll see pretty quickly what's wrong there and how much is wrong. So the paper was about random forest. If you don't know what that is, it's machine learning. The idea is that you construct multiple decision trees to obtain more accurate predictions. And um, the higher the number of trees, the higher the accuracy, very broadly speaking. And as any machine learning model, it needs to be trained on data, but when it's used for predictions, the data has to be different. You cannot use the same sample for both because otherwise by definition, your model works really well. If you predict it with the same data that you or sample that you trained it on. And that was precisely the problem here, which these um, authors that contacted us uh, found out. So most of you I'm sure are familiar with R, but you don't actually need to be to figure out the issues here. So this is a very, very brief redacted version of their actual code. And you can see, okay, we start by reading a CSV and naming it data. That's unfortunate, so it's not great naming, but okay. It gets subset for data.full. And then you'll see in all of the next steps, it's the same data set that gets used. So the code that starts with train as factor, et cetera, that's where you train the model. 
and the data they use is data.4. Then they use random forest, and they also use data.4. And they then um, predict from that sample and take random samples from the predictions they've made in sample and then compare that to data from the outside. So to cut it down is they train and predict on the same model, on the same data, and then compare that with outside data. And that's not an out of sample prediction, that's an in sample prediction, which is useless. Because every model you train on data works brilliantly predicting the same data you've just trained it on. But the authors crucially claimed that they did out of sample predictions and found that random forest was much, much better than uh, the other logit models. And my job here, after we got these letters, was to painstakingly go through every single line of code and figure out, did the authors actually do this or not? And as we could clearly see, they didn't. They had not done that. However, that was not the only problem with this code, apart from, as I already said, naming an R object data is unfortunate at best. It's not good practice. Another problem was the output they put forth for the main evidence. It was table one in the paper, and the table in the paper lists predicted probabilities for civil war onset for 19 African countries, and the authors provide a CSV file that's created by the code as the basis to form table one. And I don't think I need to say too much. You can see here on the right is the CSV that's code produced. On the left is the table in the paper. You can't match these. It's impossible. There is no way to know which number goes where. The table has 19 rows. The CSV has 737. There are no identifiers in the CSV. So nothing that tells us which is what country. Even if we assume that the uh, variable war, STDS, so war studies, if we say, okay, if that equals one, maybe that's the number of countries then? That doesn't hold up either because the number is not the same as the number of countries in the eventual table. So had I gotten this data and this code as the replicator, I would have sent this back and saying, this is meaningless. I cannot determine anything from this. You need to do this again. However, this system was not in place back in 2016 because we didn't run the code back then before I arrived. So this paper was published. Now, I told the authors about all of this, that the CSV was unusable, that uh, you did in-sample predictions, all of this. this. I told them that in 2016. Uh, about the 2016 code. The code they then sent that claimed to have rectified things was different, but it was still an in-sample code. I could show you, but it's literally the same. It also loaded a lot of different data files and it had no output for the main table. Now, I don't know about you, but when I've conducted an analysis that I then published in a paper, the number of data files I put forth doesn't really change, does it? So that was very suspicious. The output for the main table completely disappeared for some reason. And then a couple of months later, they sent us another piece of code. My guess is in the attempt to prevent us from publishing this forum on what they did wrong, where they still used in sample prediction. They went back to the data files from 2016, but they had a very suspicious CSV file. Suspicious in the sense that they sent me the code and they sent me the file. I looked at the file before I ran the code. And the file before I ran the code did not look the same as the same file after I ran the code. There was a whole column of country names in the file they sent me that wasn't actually produced by the code at all. Now you could say, okay, there's a couple of mistakes, etc. But at this point, this is my personal opinion. I thought there was something fishy going on. Now the editor decided that we should use the somewhat diplomatic route and just you know, point out the inconsistencies without um, making a judgment on them. However, I think that the authors were trying to deceive in some sense here because I can't explain all these different aspects just by, you know, they, were, they weren't that careful. So this, granted, was an extreme case. 
it's also not what replication like consistently does. So I do not go through every single line of code to figure out what each line does. That would take months. However, if the result of running your code does not match what the authors put in the paper, I sent it back. And I personally think that is a shift that we need to make in journals that have very quantitatively heavy papers. We need to move away from, okay, we want to see your data and your code to, we need to actually run it. That's what journals need to do. And authors need to know this and to know, okay, someone somewhere will run my code. How can I make my code so that it will work well? such as not using local working directories, etc. Now, currently, PA still uses the Dataverse style, meaning authors upload things, I download it, and I run it locally. That introduces loads of problems. If any of you have ever run code that was created on a Windows machine on a Mac, it's a nightmare. But that's not the author's fault, obviously. We can't have the authors responsible for covering every OS available. That's not fair. So what's the future? The future in my eyes is Docker containers. Uh, some of you probably heard of these. These are self-contained computers you access through the browser where software is installed, data uploaded, and code run all online in a remote container, which is completely removed from your local environment, which means it's replicable or reproducible across every system, Linux, Windows, Mac, whatever, and it makes everything extremely efficient and extremely effective. And we need to move towards a system that uses those systematically if we wanna speed replication up and if we wanna avoid all these, uh, well, it, normally they are just errors and, and human mistakes. And in this case with this paper, I personally would say this is deceptive. This was deception. But if we had such a system in place, this paper would never have been published in the first place. They would have had to fix a lot of things. So that from the perspective of a journal that works very heavily with quant is the key thing that we need to run the code in order to detect these kinds of things. And authors need to know that and prepare accordingly. That's it. Thank you, Simon. And, uh... Apologies for misreplicating your surname. No, terrible. No. <laughs> and uh, I have to say that um, reading the the article, the you know the whole the whole exchange with the authors, etc., that has been published at the journal in a, some sort of special issue, um, the frustration didn't come across. So they were very no. the editors, I think, were very good at uh, applying what you called a, a diplomatic route. I think. Uh, I mean, I can yeah. sense there's a lot going on behind the scenes, but not to the to the point that you um, described it here. So thank you very much. I do have a question. Um, Peter is uh, is raising a point that the time that the type of data review that you describe here, including code review, could never be checked with the fair principles, because aspects such as, such as accuracy, validity, and reliability are absent from fair. Would you like to say something about this? Or I can. I'm not particularly familiar with fair, to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, how would this not match fair? Uh, maybe Peter wants to say a few words. Um, I, I wouldn't say that that this means that what what Simon is doing is is not is not good. It's it's rather that the fair principles have some um, uh, yeah they are they are lacking. They are not looking at certain very important aspects in data. They they are more about all kinds of formal aspects and this kind of um, uh, work that that Simon is doing has much more to do with the validity of the of of the results and of the are, are they are they are they yeah are they true or are they not true do they fit with with the objectives of the research do they and and does the does the software do what it is supposed to do on the data that is used that kind of stuff is not part of the fair print. so i i'm not saying that what what simon is doing is is not fair uh, I, I i would rather 
like that the FAIR principles would include this type of, uh, of criteria as well. But the FAIR principles are now almost eight, nine years old, something like this. We need an update. Yeah, it's also, I mean, you have to, uh, you, you're very right. Uh, it is, what we do is quite particular because it's so quant heavy. I mean, many, many journals, the Zeitschrift for Soziologie, I don't know, but I would imagine they don't have that many so computationally heavy things to run. So this mm -hmm. is very specific for us. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, we found this, it's a huge nightmare for us. And um, the other thing, because you said this frustration didn't come across maybe I'm too German for it. I was quite combative. I, I wanted to, you know, show them like, no, no, no. But we went with the diplomatic route where uh, you said you've read it, the response by the authors where they claim X, Y, Z. Uh, it's not true. It's not true that they're like, this is, this is simply not true. But, you know, we pointed it out, we showed it. So, so that worked, yeah. But I thought in this kind of setting, I can give the behind the scenes uh, story because that's what it's all about. I'd actually written up a much longer paper scrutinizing all three versions of the code. Um, yeah, but we couldn't publish that. Oh, <laughs> please. Is it available anywhere? Uh, no. It's no. on my personal computer. <laughs> oh dear. Uh, Mar Mareke uh, is raising an issue here that the FAIR principles do not aim at replicability nor uh, re reproducibility. They aim at reuse. And this discussion that we are having now is currently absent from the discussion of the FAIR principles. Um, I think we should address this in the general discussion in the end. Peter, I don't know if you want to make another point. We only have about one minute left. Uh, you have well, your... it is an interesting statement, of course, in the last slide that is still on screen now, that the dataverse style of uh, archiving is full of potential problems. And uh, yeah, that, uh, that, that, that's also a point of, of perhaps that is, that is truly the case. Um, of course, it's very good that we have that, but yeah, you don't have you don't have everything and Docker containers might, uh, but, but I, I'm not sure how, where you could store Docker containers um, uh, for uh, an indefinite uh, time. Perhaps Simon has an answer yeah, to that. I would like to give the other Peter. He yeah, there's another Peter oh, there sorry. who wants to ask <laughs> a question. <laughs> sorry, thanks. Yeah. Yes, Peter Hagedus. Uh, sorry. No, no, this, this is fine. Cannot, we cannot hear you, Peter. Okay, you unmuted yourself. Maybe you can ask the question. Hmm. We still cannot hear you, Peter. Maybe you want to type in the question. I have a quick question from uh, Matthew Cannon. Was there ever a discussion about retracting the paper? Yes. Of course, <laughs> but... <laughs> uh, it was, we didn't, it, it would have been a big fight and we wanted to shy away from it. And because this was the first time something like this had happened and we wanted to mm. highlight it and see what the broader community was saying. And there was a lot of talk about it. Mm. Yeah, we, we felt kind of retraction. My personal opinion, yes, should have been retracted. Uh, but I wasn't the only one uh, or wasn't the one who decided. So, yeah. Mm. Uh, Peter has typed in his question. So very quickly, maybe you can respond. It's the same about the Dataverse. Can you tell a little bit more about the bad experience of Dataverse? Yeah. I yeah, guess. Uh, Dataverse. The bad experience is, um, imagine you have um, data and code and everything on Dataverse and you download it and you're on a Mac and then uh, the code was written on Windows. There's something called the CLang operator. It's, it's all uh, capital letters which is a sort of uh, Bayesian under the hood compiler, which is completely different in Windows and it doesn't uh, work on a Mac. Other things, uh, simple things such as the slash, which I believe, I don't know which one is which, but in Windows it's that one, on a Mac it's that one for file paths or the other way around, like whichever one that's unbelievably annoying. Uh, things like the um, working directory when it's local and you have 20 files and you have to change it 20 times and then there's a mistake and you have to do it all over again. It's, 
it's really annoying. Not to mention, maybe I have R3.4 and you have R3.6. It's very possible that that's not going to run. Um, and that's not your fault as an author. So these are some of the things. Excellent. Well, thank you, Simon. We'll move on to the um, final speaker for today, and then we can revisit some of these issues um, in the discussion. Thank you very much. So please uh, unshare so that uh, the yep. next speaker can share. OK, moving on to Matthew Cannon. That's an easier one to pronounce. <laughs> Thank you. OK. You can see me and hear me OK? Yes and yes. OK, wonderful. Thanks, um, to Seraphine and um, everyone for inviting me today. And um, thanks to the other speakers. There's been some really good uh, presentations and discussions and several of the things that other people have already mentioned um, I'll be touching on as well um, during, during this presentation. So quickly to, to cover what I'll be talking about over the next few minutes. So um, I know that Roland already mentioned the top guidelines, but I'm able to go into a little bit more detail. Um, so talk a bit more about the introduction and background of the, the top guidelines, um, what Taylor and Francis have done, previous interactions with top. Um, we also have um, some information about a journal case study, which is forthcoming, and then how we're going to look to interact with top going forward. So um, top guidelines, we've already um, mentioned them a little bit, but they were developed by the Centre of Open Science in 2015, um, and TOP stands for Transparency and Openness Promotion. Um, so these are a set of standards, and there's eight modular standards, um, each with three levels, um, and they look at how um, instructions for authors um, contain different information in their guidelines to how authors should be open, open with, their, with their research. Um, had quite wide adoption, so there's over 5,000 signatories, um, and the signatories can be individuals, but also journals and, um, and organisations. So now I'm going to give a bit more detail about what they cover. So you can see on the screen there the list of all the different things that the top right um, the top guidelines cover. As you can see, there's more than eight bullet points here, but they come under eight broad groupings. So a couple around um, data citation and transparency, um, code transparency, material transparency, and um, looking at reporting guidelines, um, different elements of pre-registration, either through the study and the analysis, um, then through the view about replication, um, publication bias, and then also things like open science badges. Um, and there's three levels. So disclose, um, require or verify. So there's three levels for each of the three things. Um, and they have a full, uh, they call it a rubric, um, which shows all the different um, things. And I'll just quickly flash it up so you can see the first couple. So here's what it says for data citation. So level zero is that there's no mention of data citation at all in the journal guidelines for what authors need to do. Um, the level one says um, that the journal describes um, citation of data and it gives examples. Um, level two says that it's required. So it tells authors in advance that they need to um, do this. And then three is actually the checking. So they say that they will publish an article until um, all the data sets have been appropriately cited. Um, so you can see how kind of these different levels get more progressive and more open and probably follows on nicely from what um, from what Simon was just saying about the difference between a journal kind of saying something's required or that journals need to do something specific or act and actually checking and kind of with um, delaying publication until some of these things have, have been done. Um, and so there's each of these three levels is available for all of those points that I, I showed on the previous slide. So following on from the announcement of the principles in 2020, their Centre of Open Science announced a top factor. So this is when they've started scoring journals based on that rubric. So they started um, scoring points to journals depending on how open um, and how they met that rubric in their instructions for authors. Um, and you can see the really nice quote here um, saying, kind of trying to explain how the top factor is different to some of the other rankings that um, are based on kind of citations or other things. So um, yeah. 
Um, if you look at the, the top factor site, you can see um, you can see all the journals that are included, um, but also search and filter the results in lots of different ways. So you can search by journal and um, can see how they score across all of the different areas of the rubric, but you can also filter by specific standards. So as an author, if you are a, there's a specific element that you're interested in, or you want to find a journal that treats a certain element in a certain way, you can use it to do that. Um, you can also search by subject. So if you want to look at which journals within a specific subject score well, or by publisher. So how have Taylor and Francis been engaging with um, top factor and top guidelines? So we have over 140 journals included in the top factor rankings and top score is about 23, which is one of our social psychology journals. Um, and quite interestingly, the majority of these are in the social sciences. So we've got a lot of journals from psychology, also behavioral science, um, communication studies, also areas like education. Uh, and then um, a smattering of journals across some other areas like criminology, politics, area studies and religion. And Taylor and Francis became um, an organisational signatory in, in 2019. Um, and following on from that and kind of in a, in a similar way, um, we've been working along um, with Centre for Open Science and looking at the top factor and trying to make some of our journals more transparent. Um, and increase the level of reproducibility. Um, so through doing that, we've been adding open science badges. Um, so this is where authors um, for journals that offer this can fill out a form to show how they've made either their data, their materials, or um, have pre-registered their, re pre their research. Um, and if they do that, they can have these badges added to their paper. Um, so it's easy to see if you're reading a paper, if there is an open data set, um, available. You can also see it in the search results or if you're scanning through a journal issue. So it's easy to spot where there may be extra resources um, that are available um, to, to support the findings of that, of that manuscript. Um, I know that I think um, Mayana and Dennis right at the start talked a bit about registered reports, um, but we do also have a number of journals that offer registered reports as an article type. Um, and I think Dennis explained it really clearly earlier, but in case you missed that or you weren't sure, um, registered reports is about sharing, sorry, is about asking researchers to, to do their research in a slightly different way. And in practice um, involves splitting the peer review process up into two parts. So the idea is that a researcher would have an idea and design um, a study to, to test it. But at that point, um, they would send it to a journal for, for peer review. Um, they can then um, get the, the normal kinds of output from the peer review. They can be rejected, they can be asked to make revisions, um, or, or it can be accepted. Um, if they receive that acceptance in principle at that stage, um, then they can go on to collect and analyse their data and write up their paper. Um, but as long as they've followed the method that they outlined in their um, stage one, they can go on and, and publish that paper, regardless of whether they have um, positive or negative findings in their, in their study. So this puts a lot more focus on the methodology that people are using rather than the, the results um, and reduces the, the opportunity for researchers to use some of those unethical um, research practices that people talked about, like harking um, or, um, yeah, like harking. Um, and we also have um, a suite of data sharing policies available for our journals to pick from. Um, I think it might be quite small on your screen there, um, but um, we have five levels that lay, range from the basic data sharing policy, um, where authors are asked nicely to share their data, but they're not required to do anything, um, through share upon request, where they can include a data availability statement, but still uh, kind of uh, reserve the right to share data with people who request it. Uh, and then the top three levels are um, about sharing the data in a repository. So the first is the publicly available policy, where the data should be in a repository, um, but the author can choose the license that it's held under. Um, and then the top two are about open data policies where the data should be open for, um, for people to, to access, um, ideally using a CC0 or a CC BY license for that data set. So I hope to be able to talk a bit more about 
what I'm doing in this case study, but um, the journal are still going through and kind of making final decisions. So I've not named the journal that we're talking about here, but just wanted to, to kind of flag this, that um, we've been in talks with one of the journals from our education um, suite for a while now, who are highly interested in making asking authors to make a full declaration of how they've met all the areas of the top guidelines. Um, so not just a, a data availability statement, but all of the all of the different areas of the top guidelines that I mentioned. Um, so the journal team has showed their commitment to this and they've added a reproducibility editor as part of the editorial team. So they're going to have a specific person working with the editors who's going to be making all these checks. Um, and working with the authors to make sure that they've been as open as possible, that everything is shared in the right way, and that all the links and files are going to be accessible for people who can, can read the paper. Um, the current idea is that the authors will submit a form with a series of statements showing how they've complied with all these areas of the top guidelines um, for the reproducibility er editor to, to check, um, and also help with the awarding of the open science badges, as, as we mentioned. At the moment, we're working out how we can include that table in the final version of the manuscript. So after the after the results but, and conclusions, but before the references, ideally they'd be a big table with all the necessary statements showing how authors have complied with all the, all the guidelines. And we also, um, as this is an education journal, it's not open access. And the idea is that these will be in front of the paywall. So um, even if people don't have access to that article to read the full text, they could um, go and check out all the materials and other items that have been shared. Um, and the idea is that we'll launch this um, next year with, uh, with the journal and the journal editors. Um, so I must have rattled through that really quick, but that was all I had. So um, yeah, I think hopefully it leaves lots more time for, for questions um, and yeah, lots of discussion as well. Yes, thank you, Matthew, um, that, and, and thanks for sticking to the time as well. And my question is in relation to the 140 journals you mentioned. I think, do you go through this process with every one of them that you just described briefly with the educational journal? No, no, so that's, um, so this is kind of a new thing that we're going to be doing on, on one journal, it's kind of a pilot. Um, for, for the journals that are in the top factor, that's um, a process that have uh, the Centre for Open Science have gone through mainly looking at the instructions for authors of a journal and kind of scoring and creating the scores based on the guidance that's available to authors um, from the journal websites. Um, so they just they read through the, the journal website and create a score based on the information that's available to the authors at that point. Thank you. I, I also forgot to make a disclaimer that we don't favor in any way Taylor and Francis. We invited a few publishers to join the event and present, and um, you were the ones who responded. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, just in case people get any wrong impressions. Um, would you like to say something, though, about this um, requirement or um, recommendation to publish on um, national repositories or data archives or people publishing the data wherever they feel like any anything on that uh, so at Taylor and Francis we don't have a policy we have guidance um, that we give to authors who need help with finding a suitable repository for their data but the page that we have um, asked them to um, ask for help in lots of other places before they rely on our guidance only. So I think it says so something like, please check with your librarian at your institute if you need help with selecting a repository because they may be able to guide you. And if not, please check with colleagues. So someone who works in your subject area may also have ideas or guidance um, to, to help you find a suitable repository for your data. Um, and then we give links to re 3 data and fair sharing. So the two main repository catalogs and then after that, we then say, and if you're still really stuck, um, here's some general repositories that provide kind of a solid service. So Zenodo, Figshare, Dryad, um, Dataverse, et cetera. 
Um, so, so yeah, so as a publisher, when we don't want to be directive as to where people put their data, it's really up to the authors, but we do get a lot of questions, especially for journals who have that open data policy about, well, where do I start? Where do I put my data? Um, yeah, and we also have problems kind of similar to what Simon was saying, where people try and put a link to their data, but it's the hard drive of their own PC and things like that. So, um, not very uh, fair at all. And um, I cannot see any questions on the chat. If if anyone has questions, please raise your hand and unmute yourself or post a question. There was a bit of discussion about uh, Simon's presentation earlier, but uh, it would be nice to have questions about Matthew as well. We have a few minutes. I was slightly worried I was being very controversial with all the, I could see all the questions popping up whilst I was, uh, whilst I was talking. No, it wasn't about. <laughs> Gladly they are directed for Simon. Um, we have a, a question from Simon and one from Roland. We'll start with Roland, please. Sorry, I think Simon was first, but oh, <laughs> I just sorry. continue. Okay. Um, if that's okay for you. Um, yeah, I was wondering, the top guidelines have three different levels which you can implement. Do you aim for implementation of a specific level or um, would you be satisfied if the journal start with level one and go to the higher levels later? I'm asking because you mentioned this uh, author's note and many of the higher levels require quite a lot of work from the editors as well to check for the standards and I'm wondering how you handle the situation. Yeah, thank you. It's a good question. So um most of the the top guidelines is kind of about the information that's available to authors so kind of is this information in the instructions for authors or not um and so yeah for the journals that have so we have some journals that have signed um top guidelines and for those we've made sure that they're at least at level one um so and i think for the data they're on our policy which means authors have to include a data availability statement even if the data is not open so that's kind of compliant with the first level of top um, um but yeah so i think that but as you say if you want to do anything higher than that we need kind of buy-in from the editors um to, to for, for checking especially for the top levels um and for for us we see there's a lot of pressure on editors at the moment in not only in kind of finding reviewers processing things quickly providing good feedback to authors um and saying, actually, could you also do all these checks um, is, is, is asking for a lot of extra work. Um, and um, yeah, I think we know that a lot of our editors are, well, most of the editors are academics and they have their own research and their own things to do. And they often do the journal editing in their evenings and weekends. Um, and so adding kind of significantly extra work to do for every paper um, is only something that we kind of allow editors to do if they're willing to do it we're not going to push them to say you must do it because it's a pretty significant undertaking um, I quite like the idea that this education journal has taken um, where they've kind of added a rep uh, replicability reproducibility editor to um, their their team and he's going to be the one that's kind of doing extra checks kind of separate to the peer review process on papers that are accepted so they're not doing it on everything at submission. They're probably going to do it further down to kind of limit the, the extra work that you might do for then something to be rejected by a peer review. Um, so yeah, so I think that might be a way forward. Um, I was also really interested to hear about um, Simon's role at his previous journal. And um, I think there's, um, yeah, potentially a lot of appetite for those sorts of roles in the future. Um, but I think it's interesting where you might have like he was working on a politics journal, but you obviously need a certain amount of kind of data skills to be able to do that. And actually, um, yeah, um, it's kind of interesting when you think you might need kind of a subject specialist in order to be able to kind of review the content of the paper, but then a sort of data expert um, to be able to look at the data and code and check that they do what they say they do um, and how similar those skills are whether you could ask reviewers to do that for papers usually, whether you need a different set of skills. There's a, there's a lot of things that start to become apparent when you start to unpick some of those things. Simon also had a question and then we can move on to the general discussion. Yeah, I'd be interested in how you um, got into that line of work because uh, that's something I'm, I'm quite interested in, Matt. So if, I don't know what, what your story is, where you, where you come from. So I'd be interested to hear about that if you want to talk about it. 
Uh, sure. Just because I see it quickly, Deborah, that's exactly what we did. We applied for data access, which prolongs everything by a couple of months. We only had a select few, so that's so for yeah. us it was okay. But I can see that it's a real problem. Yeah, definitely. And before yeah. Matt, I only got more questions because mine was about a fight. So, yeah. <laughs> but, but Martin, very <laughs> quickly, if you can people, respond you know? <laughs> quickly because uh, we want to move on to the more general discussion. Sure. Yeah. So um, I have been at Taylor Francis for quite a while. I started in 2008, so 14 years or something. So I've worked with journals and journal publishing for quite a long time um, at different levels and different subject areas. Um, and the last subject level portfolio I worked on was Earth and Environmental Science and got into aspects of data sharing through conversations with the American Geophysical Union and that's those sorts of groups. Uh, and then a couple of years ago, Taylor and Francis created this open science role, open research role, um, and moved into that. And now I have kind of this broad role looking at all areas of open research, not open access, specifically not open access, but preprints, register reports, badges, um, and with a big chunk of time looking at data sharing policy. So that's, that's kind of great. Fun. Thank you for the, for the summary. Um, okay, now I would like to open um, the discussion to everyone. We only have about 14 minutes left for this. I think we addressed most of the questions to the speakers and I didn't see any more popping up. So what we tried to do with this session was to have a diversity, both in terms of speakers, in terms of disciplines, sub-disciplines, different approaches, etc. Um, yes, please ask questions or um, express your reflections. Yes, uh, Arike. Yeah, thank you. So um, um, I'm a research data management support officer at the Copenhagen Business School. So my background is also social sciences. And um, well, we are kind of in the in the process of uh, getting our researchers interested in all these different topics. So I've been uh, thinking a lot about, uh, on the one hand, replicability and reproducibility, but also, on the other hand, also this aspect of, uh, of data reuse and, uh, and the FAIR principles. Um, and uh, I, I would like to start off um, just one remark to Peter Thorne, uh, who was uh, highlighting that the FAIR principles do not address this aspect of data quality that uh, we've discussed this afternoon. And to some degree, I'm, I, I agree with him, but still, if you really look under principle, and now I have to check it on my screen, <laughs> it's, uh, I think, R, uh, one of the, the reuse principles. So let me check. It's uh, actually R 1.2. Um, there, um, it is pointed out um, where you describe the provenance of the data. There you could include um, data quality considerations and you are actually asked to um, retrace the origin and history of your data. So this would be the place under the FAIR principles to address questions of data quality. But this hasn't been kind of the focus area in, in, in my understanding. Um, and, and I think this has to do, and this is my second point, um, with the focus on data reuse. Because when we are talking data reuse, um, what we would want to publish and to be reused is the raw data. It's not the process data. It's the raw data because the process data are, are not a, do not have a great reuse value for others. They are very relevant to process data um, for everything that concerns both replicability and reproducibility. So I think we have to start discussing um, what kind of data do we need? And, and I found uh, Simon's point, um, process data have to be published in Docker containers so they can be run uh, regardless of uh, the operating system um, in, in order to reproduce results that have been published in journals. This is very important, but this is some a different discussion. It's a discussion that is related 
but different from this whole idea of data reuse and the this the internet of, of fair data and services that uh, have been envisioned with the uh, with the fair principles i don't find these uh, exclusive of one another but i think it's really important to to keep these things apart and to be very specific, like what are we actually talking about? So this is, but as I was saying, I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of thinking about it, so I don't have any answers. And <laughs> I just wanted to, to make this point. So thanks, yes, for thanks for raising listening. It. Yes, thank you for raising it. Yes, very important. Uh, if anyone wants to respond, I think Peter, your name was mentioned there, Roland's as well, or Simon's. Okay, if I if I may, um, yes, yes, of course. Um, in a way, you know, in the whole uh, idea of quality control, the uh, the the core idea is that um, if you can follow the whole process in which, for instance, a product, let it be chocolate, is is made, um, then you have, uh, in in essence, good quality. But of course, even if that is all guaranteed, you you still don't know if it tastes good. And um, uh, if, if all the formal criteria are passed, then probably the quality of the chocolate is okay. And uh, like also with data, but it is not necessarily so that it is, um, um, that it is, is, is good, good chocolate or good data. And um, this is also probably why it, it, it is of course uh, very hard because there is also a matter of taste um, involved in the, in the case of chocolate. And in the case of data, um, it is often so that the data that is collected, it is collected in the context of a certain research question, things that you want to answer. So whether that fits, it depends on the research and whether the data is good for you um, uh, also depends whether the, the uh, um, uh, what what you want to do with it. It can be marvelous data, let us say, in terms of um, how it was processed and, and you name it, and all the metadata may be okay and so on, but it still doesn't say whether it is it is useful for you. And um, And this is exactly, I think, why it is so hard to measure that kind of more qualitative um, uh, things. We also have a question, thank you, Peter, from Deborah. Um, Deborah will share. Thanks, Arisim. It's just a, a follow up from my question in the chat, which Simon kindly has already responded to, but I just wanted to gauge how much of an issue the use of secure data is when we consider the need. Um, which Simon has very clearly demonstrated, to run people's code rather than just look at it. So increasingly, more and more secure data is being made available, more and more research is being done using secure data. Now, for those of you not familiar, this is data that cannot be widely accessed, so it can only be accessed under very secure conditions. Now, the only option at the moment is what Simon um, has done previously is for the journal to apply for data access, which can take several months depending on the service. So my question is for anyone involved in journals, how big a problem is this in reality? And is it worth trying to find a more elegant solution than people like Simon having to put in lengthy applications. Thank you. Anyone who would like to respond to this or reflect on this? I wasn't sure whether, I'm not really sure of what the alternative would be. Like I think if ultimately what we want research to do is to allow other people to pick it up and use it you probably need another human to pick it up and use it to like find all those errors um i think ultimately you might want some sort of clever checking type automated solution to be able to do this at scale if you think about journals that publish thousands and thousands of papers a year 
that's probably what you would like to get to but I think we're probably a long way from that mm -hmm. um, and yeah I think yeah I think ultimately that's what we should like is to have like some automated thing where everyone puts their things in the capsule and then there's mm -hmm. said, you know we found these errors or we've corrected this thing for you but I think we're a long way away from that and I think a lot of journals still don't really have these people actually doing that checking it's all kind of taken on faith or hoped slash expected that editors or peer reviewers will pick up this and i still think that might not be well it probably isn't happening at the scale that we might want it to and there's still lots of questions about like data peer review like who should do it how should it happen how does this happen with regard to kind of valuation of a general manuscript or not how does this kind of sit or different from curation provided by repository like there's still lots of things to think about just with data never mind kind of code capsules and linking data sets and code capsules and things like that i don't know does that help it does thank you nobody we've had this discussions within the secure data world for for a quite a long time now we have not come up with any hope of a solution yet but you know we keep talking about it and it's just useful to know whether it's it's worth having those conversations Deborah if, if I can add and um, hello everyone and for those who don't me uh, know me I'm um, from ADP, which is a Slovene uh, data archive, but also leading a training working group under which this is organized. I'm just wondering, Deborah, I mean, in reality, researchers don't do the, use a full database when they're doing analysis on something. So there might be a way of trying to separately store uh, those five variables that they're actually working on because those variables might not be that highly sensitive once you consider reviewing them um, self-standing and not with a, a full data set, but just as an example. Yeah, thanks. Maybe I can jump in. Yes, uh, please, yes. here. Uh, uh, I think b b both uh, uh, issues that Deborah and Marika raise uh, are, are, are very um, w well well uh, posed. Uh, and well, uh, the the Deborah uh, uh, question for for this how to access and, and try to replicate the the uh, data that is behind uh, the security. Uh, uh, the access uh, uh, conditions and so on. Uh, perhaps uh, in, in a sense of uh, to, to, to encourage this replication uh, as such, uh, uh, it's, it's uh, maybe related to, to uh, how, how we value the, the, the publication as such. Uh, for example, uh, there are now this replication journals uh, occurring or, or papers that that are actually evaluated for for replication there maybe someone uh like simon could you know publish uh, uh, a replication uh, made on this uh, secure access uh, data when he would be kind of encouraged to to uh, go into this direction and spend some time to to do this uh, so maybe this is one of the questions, but the other question, I think it's it's also related to uh, how how we document uh, the data that was used in this secure environment, for example, in NSI or, or uh, some, some other. Uh, uh, I, I would also, also like to comment on Marike's uh, question, and I, I think this is also related to uh, where, where do we want now go with, with uh, this uh, question of uh, if, if we if we only uh, uh, encourage this uh, small uh, data uh, that that it's available for, for replication, then actually we, we lose this uh, potential for for reuse there. And uh, I think that there is uh, more in this reproducibility in a sense that. Uh, 
uh, actually there are different streams on the, the data that it's for reuse uh, there. It, it should be also uh, there, uh, for example, uh, not, uh, the, the, related, the data that's related to paper usually has only a small amount of variables there, and we want to have this for 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 uh, wider reuse. We need to have uh, uh, a data that's uh, on bigger samples and have more variables and uh, so on. So uh, I think that these are all, all, all the issues that are, that are uh, worth of considered further. Thanks. Um, the, the discussion is uh, going on really well, so I would like to overrun a little bit, <laughs> if you don't mind. Uh, so thank you for your contributions. I don't know if Marika would like to respond to this. Uh, there is also a parallel discussion happening in the chat room. Um, okay, so there is a discussion about um, how GISIS is um, is tackling request to accessing the data, the secondary data, and then Simon responded a little bit lengthily there. So rather than read it, maybe you want to say something, Simon? Um, uh, sure, but I've been talking a lot, so I just want to give others. It just this was okay. just for Deborah. It doesn't solve anything about access and transparency. It's just what we used to do, uh, just to allow authors to publish, because we didn't want to say, hey, we can't have it, so screw you. So in extreme cases, we said, okay, make a video of five hours and send it to us. But that doesn't really help anyone in the long run. Okay. Yes, as I said, we will overrun by five or so minutes. So if anyone would like to uh, contribute any more thoughts. If I, if I may, yes, uh, Irena. Um, for the film, I, I would just like to, to add, I mean, it was, it was discussed and mentioned but I see that I think from from students on that that they try to do the work in relation to always prove the positive hypothesis, and we we all know as researchers that without several negative ways we will never get a good result. But uh, it's it's interesting really to see that, and as it was pointed out by two speakers, that that basically the. Um, the the papers that are published are always with a positive you know kind of results to the hypothesis and yeah um i know that this is kind of uh, i think the the discussion in, in in the world of publishing and authors but it would be really really nice to try to encourage already for students you know uh, kind of the paths that negative is also a result um but you know, when they come to the negative, they delete everything and do it once again. So yeah, just trying to point out that that we all see this in the, in the students' lives. Okay. Right. Um, so thank you, Irena. I, I'm sure you all agree that uh, each one of these uh, short 15 to 20 minute sessions could have taken an hour. <laughs> so I would like to thank all the presenters especially of the second part, I already thank the presenters from the first part, for uh, sticking to the time and, and condensing such so much material in 15 minutes, and also for uh, the people who engaged with uh, presentations and asked the very interesting questions. Um, uh, it's all very much appreciated. I would like to encourage you strongly to respond to the invitation to provide feedback so that um, we can organize another event or a follow-up event. We will see how this is going. Um, as I said in the beginning, the task two agenda is in relation to general outreach. I already uh, posted the website and there is also a, a group that we can use for further discussion. And I would also like to thank, um, apart from all the speakers and yourselves for attending, I would like to thank Irena as well for um, kind of leading the whole um, training package uh, from SESTA. So without further ado, I would like to close this session. Uh, thank you again and uh, please respond to the feedback. If you have any specific uh, concerns, questions or if the speakers would like to not make the uh, talks available or the 
um, presentations available or re change them in any way, please contact me and we can take care of this. So thank you all and have a nice afternoon stroke evening. <laughs>